All right, I think I'm live. Sorry about that. It's This is my first time doing a scheduled live stream, and I couldn't figure out how to start it. Can everybody hear me okay? Is anyone able to use the chat? Can everyone hear me okay? Or can anyone? Okay, cool. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. So uh, my name is Stacy Farina, and I am an assistant. There's an echo. Okay. Um, not sure how to stop that. Okay. Uh, let me know if it gets really bad, and I can see if I can do something. I'm also going to maybe talk a little more quietly, and maybe that will stop the echo. I'm not sure how loud I have to speak for you guys to hear me. So if I speak too quietly, let me know about that, too. Hello. Yeah, so my name is Cece Farina. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Biology at Howard University. And today is my first day back in the lab since May, which is really exciting. Hey, Emily. And so um, I'm just, you know, really enthusiastic to be able to be back. Unfortunately, none of my students are allowed to come back um, because of safety. You know, we're really trying to limit the amount of traffic that we have in the building and on campus. And so um, we're sort of bringing back students on a very limited basis. Oh, cool. Awesome. So, um, so I'm really excited. I heard there was some talk on Twitter about goosefish, and they're one of my favorite fish. Maybe, maybe actually, I think I could probably safely call them my favorite fish at this point. Um, goosefish, they're also called monkfish. So if you find them in the grocery store, you'll find it labeled monkfish. That's the culinary name. I guess nobody wants to eat a goosefish, but monkfish sounds, sounds pretty appetizing. So people are willing to go for that. And, you know, why, why would anybody find these fish unappetizing in the first place. Most people think that they're pretty ugly. So this is a goosefish. The genus is Lophius. The species is Americanus. So this is Lophius Americanus. There are um, several goosefish species in the genus Loph Lophius. Um, uh, in this part of the world, um, in the mid-Atlantic, we get two different species. We get this one, the Lophius Americanus, and we also get one um, called the black fin goosefish, with it, which is uh, Lophius gastrophysis. And um, so this is the um, most common species that we see here. The European version is Lophius piscatorius, but this is the American version. They all look very, very similar. The only way you can tell the black fin and the um, American apart is the color of their fins, but you can see this guy even has pretty dark fins. Um, so it's really tough to tell the species apart. They all pretty much look like this. They're all pretty, well, most people think they're ugly. I think that they're pretty, um, especially because I've had the fortune, I've had the great fortune to be able to work with them uh, in life. So before they get to this point where they're just sort of a husk of their former selves, they're very cute. If, if you get, ever get to see them in an aquarium, they have a lot of personality. Um, they like to sit around a lot and do uh, a whole lot of nothing, which I feel very akin to. That's also what I enjoy doing. So um, so I really think that like they have their own little personalities. They build their own little like holes in the sediment to just sort of be able to just sit and enjoy themselves. And so they're really beautiful in life, um, like many fish, uh, and but unfortunately not super beautiful in depth. Um, so, as we were talking about on, and, and by the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. There's no, I have no agenda for today or anything. I'm going to walk through the things that I think are cool about goosefish and that I usually um, like to explain to people. But at any point you have a question, feel free to interrupt me um, with a question. This is sort of just informal. I just decided to do this. Uh, why not? It's a Friday. It's my first day back in lab since May, and I'm just really excited to be able to, to do stuff like this again. I'm really lucky to be able to have a lab and a freezer full of fish to dissect and look at. Um, so 
Oh, and that I should say where this fish came from. One of the reasons I am lucky to have all of this material is because I get it from the National Marine Fishery Service. So, um, and in particular, one up in uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. So in Woods Hole, there is a facility called the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And they, every fall and spring, they go out and they do surveys and they collect fish. And the goal is to um, collect fish, measure them, uh, weigh them, record the species, record um, any other um, important features that jump out at them. And then they use that data to under, better understand the fisheries. So they're going out and they're randomly sampling. And when fishermen go out, they, um, they're going out for targeted reasons. They're going out to get cod, they're going out to get haddock or halibut. Um, but when the National Marine Fishery Services go out, they're going out, they go out to the same random um, sites uh, um, over the years. They'll do, they, they have years and years and years, decades of data uh, from you know going and randomly sampling so that they actually have a good sense of what kind of fish are out there and in what numbers. And so we have we have data from the fisheries. So when um, fishers bring back their catch and we find it in the grocery store, we get some data from that. We we have a sense of how the fishery is doing, how much is being caught. Um, but the uh, the surveys that the National Marine Fisheries do are fisheries independent. So they're not relying on you know targeted fishing in order to um, it's sort of an independent line of investigation to understand the health of fisheries. Um, of commercially important, so this is somewhat commercially important. So we commercially fish these. So like I said at the very beginning, if you missed it, this is uh, a goose fish. But it, um, if you find it in the grocery store, you're going to see that it's called a monk fish because it just sounds more appetizing. And so there is a commercial fishery for these guys, um, but they're um, uh, so they're commercially important. But we can also the National Marine Fisheries Service helps us learn about commercially important fish, fish, but also just fish populations in general. And so every year when they do their surveys, I like to put in a request. I usually request these guys because they're great for teaching. I do some research on them. Um, and so it's great to have these around whenever I need to pull one out. And also um, I get a bunch of other material uh, to do research on. Uh, my graduate student, uh, Kyra Amaker is working on fish hearts. And so she's gonna be getting material from the, uh, from the National Marine Fisheries on all different species of fish so that she can, um, uh, bring, um, CT scan their hearts and understand heart anatomy across all the different species we get here in the Atlantic. So we use them for research, we use the material for teaching, and we're very grateful that they give it to us um, so that we can, we can use it. So um, that's where I got this guy. All right, so um, a goosefish is an anglerfish, and what inspired this uh, live stream today was actually a question by Emily Kane, who is with us in the audience. Um, we, uh, and her question was, was very specific, and we'll get into it, um, but it had to do with the fact that these guys are anglerfish. Um, they're not deep sea anglerfish, so we can actually catch them. Um, my, my mask is slipping off my nose. I'm gonna let that happen. There's nobody else here, so um, the mask is mostly just to like promote mask wearing when you return to lab. So uh, if it drops from my nose, I'm not endangering anyone. Um, but I've also got really gooey hands. Uh, I should mention, these guys are really gooey. They have no scales. Uh, let me put my plastic back on my computer. So they have no scales. Their skin is very smooth, but it's also very slimy. They produce mucus as a protective coating to protect themselves because they don't have scales. So they produce a lot of mucus. Got it all over my hands. So not a whole lot of mask adjusting is gonna happen. So um, they're, goosefish are anglerfish. And um, so they're not deep sea, but they, and so they occur in shallow water. So you can find them in pretty shallow waters. Don't let that scare you. I know they look kind of scary, but they leave humans alone. But they do have a lure. And this is one of their lures. Um, this is called the Elysium. It's like a little fishing rod. And at the end of the fishing rod, you can see a little, um, a little lure, and that is called the esca. 
And so basically the ESCA is designed to look like a little like amphipod or something that a small fish might be interested in eating. And the goosefish wiggles it around. And when another smaller fish comes around to grab it, the goosefish grabs the little guy. So this is actually very similar to a fishing lure that we might use. And um, like I said, these guys aren't deep sea, so this isn't bioluminescent, so they don't actually light this up. Um, they just flick it around, and they have all these little muscles in here that control that little flicking. So they can kind of, you just watch them, you can watch them sitting there, they just kind of flick this around, just kind of haphazardly, just, you know, just trying to be unassuming, uh, waiting for something to, to fall for the trick. And as other people pointed out on Twitter today, um, they have two lore, they have two Elysium. So they've got another one back here. And so sometimes they end up using both and they have an independent set of muscles so they can actually use both of them um, independently of each other. So we have a question from uh, Haley Amplo. Um, Haley studies frogfish. Um, she does really cool work on frogfish locomotion. And her question is, when you cut into a goosefish, is there a jelly-like substance under the skin, um, between the, the skin and the muscle tissue? And I know why she's asking that, because you find that um, in frogfish. I don't want to bury Haley's, uh, Haley's lead, but she's seen that. And, um, and uh, that occurs in um, the larval goosefish, but I've never heard about it or seen it in... Um, an adult. So this is an adult. And the one that we looked at um, today, might as well just remove the mask, huh? Well, I don't know. You have to touch it either way. Hmm. I'm going to unglove. All right. So just so you know, I'm not, there's nobody in lab with me. I'm not endangering anybody, but I do want to promote do you want to promote the idea that we can go back to lab and wear our masks and um, and not have it be a huge deal? Um, so, unfortunately, if your hands are literally covered in goo, it's not very easy to adjust your mask. All right. I'll go for the fancy gloves that she loved. It was breaking on me. All right. So, yeah, so I've never seen any gel-like stuff, but lar uh, in larval goosefish, people have reported that. And so this is an adult. The one uh, we saw on Twitter today, if you guys saw the original post that sort of kicked this off, um, it was a CT scan of a juvenile or a young of the year, probably just was born um, shortly, um, you know, the same year that it was caught. And um, so it was, so the, and when we CT scan things, we generally have to CT scan pretty tiny things unless we're using like a vet CT. So that goose fish was probably about this, this long, probably pretty short. This is a mature adult. They do get quite a bit bigger. Um, the biggest one that I've ever been able to dissect was 60 pounds and um, about a meter long. So they get very big. Um, but this is a typical, um, typical pretty well along um, adult probably has gone through um, at least one reproductive cycle, if not a few more. So, um, so we had talked about on Twitter these little lures, and we saw them very nicely in the CT scan, and we noticed that they were. Um, Emily noticed that it was askew a little bit to the left, but I want you to notice that on this guy, they're pretty much dead center. At least I think, and then maybe, maybe it does skew, actually. Now that I look at it through the camera lens, maybe it does skew. So it's, it's sort of left of center. And I think um, Rachel, um, who is a frogfish expert and a low feeiform, so these are low feeiforms. And so we, like we mentioned, they're angler fishes. Um, angler fishes and low feeiforms mean the same thing. And so... Um, so this is an anglerfish. It's got its little angle, angler. And, and Rachel has suggested that um, usually the, the lure sort of leans one way or the other. And I can kind of see that. I mean, it definitely falls one way or the other. Let's see if I can make it fall straight. So, you know, maybe just slightly off center. But the cool thing, let's see if I can do this. 
is that it actually can move around quite a bit. I'm trying to figure out how I can arrange my hands so I can show you. So I can actually push it back and forth. So they've, they've got tons and tons of little muscles here. And the muscles, uh, I believe Rachel has studied the muscles that control this sort of back and forth movement, but mostly the fish is trying to control the flicking. So they have all these little muscles in there to control the flicking. And the reason that, one of the reasons that these little, um, this little elysium, this little lure is so free floating is because it's not actually part of the skull. It's actually part of the dorsal fin. So like most fish, whose fish have a dorsal fin. So here's the dorsal fin. Dorsal just means it's on the top of the body. Here's the dorsal fin. And then there's a little, there are a couple more dorsal fin rays up here. So a little bit more dorsal fin here. Um, but then some of the dorsal fin spines have moved from their normal position, which would be about here. So you can see some of the little spines sticking out. Normally on a fish, they would be, they would end basically behind the skull. But in goosefish, they've moved, migrated all the way up, and in lophiiforms or anglerfishes in general, they've moved all the way up to the tip of the snout. And so that's actually part of its dorsal fin. These two little spines here are dorsal fin spines. And so that's why they're really not attached to anything, because they're not technically supposed to be part of the skull, but the goosefish we know are doing something really strange. So there's their little luring apparatus. And yeah, I would say maybe it's you know, left of center, not perfectly lined up. I'm not sure what was going on in the CT scan. It may very well be that um, when the specimen was preserved, it was sort of preserved with the spine pushed a little bit out of the way it would be in life, but that also might just be how the fish is. I'm not 100% sure, but at least now we know what it looks like in, a, in a, an adult. Yeah, so Emily asks, are the muscles that modify, uh, operated also modified from the ones that operate the dorsal fin? I am not the best person to answer that, but I am almost certain that that is the case, that the muscles that um, are that control these movements are dorsal fin spine muscles that have traveled up along with the um, fin muscles. Yeah, no problem. If this is your lunch break, if you're on the, if you're on the uh, West Coast, maybe this is not the most appetizing lunch break, but I'm glad you joined us and I hope you have a good time. So we're going to move on from the lure. Does anybody have any questions about the, the little luring apparatus that they have here? Yeah. And, uh, you know, anytime we want to do dissections, I have a, a bunch of other weird stuff in my freezer. Um, but also a lot of other ichthyologists have weird stuff in their freezer. It's kind of a thing. So we should just have every, a different person do this every Friday. All right, so, um, so we're gonna move on from the spine. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about their teeth. As Jonathan pointed out, they have pretty gnarly looking teeth. And they've got them on their upper jaw and their lower jaw. You can't really see the upper jaw ones because they are very covered in slime right now. But if you poke them, they are definitely there. And they're definitely very sharp and pointy. Not the last thing that you want to see. It may be the last thing that you see if you're a fish. You might notice that it does have pharyngeal teeth. So it does have teeth in the back of the throat. Oh, can the ESCA exude chemicals to attract prey? I'm fairly certain. I think I've heard that too. I'm not 100% sure, but um, I, I believe that I have heard that. Oh, don't, Haley, don't get me started about freezer breaking. That's my biggest nightmare. If this freezer that I have goes down, the whole building is going to know about it um, pretty quickly. So that's that always keeps me up at night. Is my freezer going to go down? Um, so the question um, uh, from um, uh, Pemua, uh, and let me know if I um, don't uh, pronounce that correctly, um, is um, do they have a set of teeth like humans do in terms of the order um, with it, that they occur in the mouth, like inside those canines molars? Um, they actually don't. And that is true of all fish, um, with a very, very few exceptions. Uh, most fish have what's called um, homodonty, 
which means the um, homo meaning same tooth. We have heterodonty, so our teeth are all different from each other. But fish, the teeth are more or less the same along the jaw. And there is some really cool research um, by Carly Cohen at the University of Washington that is starting to sort of put so doubts into the idea of, of fish being true homodonts. But for the most part, um, fish teeth are sort of consistent looking throughout the jaw. So this one doesn't have any molars. They're all basically the same shape. There are, of course, fish. There are fish with crushing teeth. There are fish with fangs. There are fish with all sorts of um, different types of teeth. Um, but, you know, for the most part, the average fish just has the same looking teeth throughout the jaw. So that's an excellent question. Are they depressible? Um, um, so these are great questions. So um, let's start with um, John's question. So um, are they depressible? Yes, absolutely. And this is something that we've studied and we are working on a paper. It's kind of um, hard during COVID, um, but we are still studying the teeth of these guys. And they actually are very depressible. So I'm gonna try to show you that. I think I can. So you see how I'm pushing down on the teeth and they're depressing? You guys able to see that? So I'm pushing down on them and they're popping back up. Very, very cool. And the reason that they do that is very much the same reason why we have those spikes when you go into a garage and they, the, the people who control the garage don't want you to go out that direction. You, when you go the direction you're supposed to go, you push those spikes down and the spikes don't hurt your tires at all. But if you try to go in the opposite direction, the spikes don't get pushed down, they catch, and that prevents you, or that will destroy your tires, but it also prevents you from leaving um, by providing some resistance. And so if a fish is entering the mouth, these teeth fold in very nicely. I can push my hand in. I'm pushing pretty hard on these teeth. I don't feel a thing poking through. I'm not going to go in the opposite direction because it would be a very different story. If I got my hand stuck in there and tried to pull it out, these teeth, even with the fish being dead, these teeth would lock into place and they, it would be really hard for me to get my hand out. And that's actually like most of most of people's sort of anecdotal negative experiences with goosefish when they're scuba diving um, is that they will get like their flipper stuck in the mouth because, you know, the fish will go for the flipper or the flipper will accidentally end up in, a, in the fish's mouth because these guys are very cryptic. They sit on the bottom. They're very hidden. And so if, if you step on them with a flipper um, and they, your teeth, their teeth get caught, those teeth are stuck on that flipper. And so, you know, if you're a diver, I can imagine it's probably pretty frightening having a fish like this stuck to the bottom of your foot, but um, they're not doing it on purpose and they can't actually control it. Um, the way that this works is they're basically, um, uh, they have little uh, ligaments that um, basically hold them onto the jaw, but otherwise they're not fused to the jaw. So they're not fused so that they can be depressed very easily. Um, but when you push back on them, they, they, they um, are just sort of on the inside of the jaw and they have a little pedestal that they, that they sit on. And basically, so basically when you pull, push them in this direction, they basically catch on the jaw. So they bend very easily because there's nothing blocking them in this direction. But if you try to push in this direction, the jaw is what stops them. Yes, it's very unfortunate if your flipper gets caught in these guys. And Haley asked, are the teeth in, on the pharyngeal jaws? So the pharyngeal jaws are the ones um, inside the mouth. So you can see here that this fish has teeth inside its mouth. And the big difference between the teeth inside and outside the mouth is that the pharyngeal teeth aren't hinged. They, don't, they aren't depressible. So the pharyngeal jaws are, their, their teeth are pretty different. Um, I think their development is also probably quite different. Um, but they, um, they don't, they, they basically just serve to prevent the fish from leaving the throat once the fish has gotten into the throat. And if the fish has gotten that far, I'm sorry to say the fish isn't coming back out. Um, so that answers, uh, Haley's questions. Um, yeah. And, uh, so are the teeth, um, in the same space or are they placed randomly? 
we're actually finding with our research, and actually, do I have a job? I have a, a couple jaws of, of goosefish in the in my drawer that have been prepared. And at the end, if I have time, I can bring them out, but I don't want to get into that with my with my gooey hands right now. But we're finding from studying the teeth really, really carefully that they're arranged in three rows. And you can kind of get a sense of the different rows looking at them, but you have to look at them pretty closely and not and only uh, see that they're um, in different rows and the ones that have emerged, but there are also developing teeth uh, coming in uh, in between and behind the ones that are currently, that we can currently see. It's very relaxing to just sit here and just play with this. They're very depressible. So are the teeth um, also depressible on the premaxilla and the maxilla? Um, some of them, the premaxilla have, and this is like for teeth nerds, <laughs> the premaxilla has like a bunch of big teeth, but also like a bunch of little tiny teeth that are not depressible. The sort of ridge like you can see them really well over here. Um, they do have some bendable teeth, um, but not very many. Um, I don't think they have, they do have teeth on the vomer, but the vomer teeth are also not bendable. And so what do we mean by pre-maxilla and maxilla? Hey Lydia. Uh, Lydia was a, um, a REU student at Friday Harbor Labs this summer and she worked on um, uh, she worked on um, bendiness, bendiness of fish, so how fish move their vertebral column when they swim. Uh, and so, um, so uh, one interesting thing about goosefish. So when we when we think about um, teleos, so most most marine fish that you can think about that have bones are teleos. And they're known for their incredible premaxillary protrusion, which is basically they have um, the ability to protrude their upper jaws. And these guys can do it too, but it's not really that um, dramatic. These guys aren't doing a whole lot, and they're doing a whole lot of suction feeding, but it's mostly powered by their ventral muscles rather than by their premaxilla expansion. But you can see the jaw, they do have protrusible upper jaws. All right, so um, any questions about their jaws or their teeth? They're pretty cool. All right. Yeah, so not only, when, whenever a teleos ex, uh, protrudes their maxilla, the uh, pre-maxilla, the maxilla comes along too. So you can see, so the bone I'm pulling on is the pre-maxilla and then this, max, this bone here is the maxilla and you can see that it not just pulls forward, but it also rotates quite a bit. And that's just all soft tissue um, uh, ligaments and tendons just pulling um, to make sort of the cone-like shape that you would expect um, a suction feeding fish to have. All right, so uh, anything else about the, the mouth? Okay, so another thing that I want to point out, point out. Um, so in addition to having pointy teeth, they have a bunch of other pointy um, structures on their skull. And I'm trying to figure out how to grab this in such a way that I don't get pricked. Um, so they have a bunch of, they have a whole ridge of spines that go above their eye. So this is kind of like dentistry, but dentistry for fish. Especially the CT scans, you can really see the details of the dentition. So we have CT scans, we have dissections and, and, um, and prepared skeletal stuff. So we're really interested in fish dentistry as well. So um, you've got ridges that are really spiky. So that is one way that this guy defends himself because most of the time he's just sitting there sort of, um, he's kind of a sitting duck. There's not a whole lot that this fish can do if something finds it and decides to eat it. Except that it tries to make itself unappetizing by having spines on the head. And also the most formidable spies, uh, spines are these spines here. They're very large. Let me see if I can show you. So they've got these large spines and those are coming off 
of the pectoral girdle. So basically their shoulder. So this is the shoulder and this is the pectoral fin. And so on their shoulder, they have these big spines. All right, um, so um, while we're talking about pectoral fins, the other really cool thing about these guys is their fins. Yep, slime and spikes, it's pretty much, pretty much the name of the game. So lots and lots of uh, slime on these pectoral fins that I'm holding. So these are their pectoral fins. And so when this fish is sitting in its little uh, area that it's dug out for itself, it'll sit there with its fins kind of sticking out as a way to help break up its outline and sort of prop itself up and hold itself in position. So it's got really big pectoral fins. They also are used during swimming. So the fish will use these um, uh, kind of to glide and a little bit of, of powered locomotion from the pectoral fins. And then these down here are the pelvic fins. So these are basically their hind limbs. So if these are their arms and then their shoulders, this is their hind, their hind limbs or their legs and their pelvis. And it's, you can see like a lot of teleosts, their pelvis is all the way up underneath their chin, right underneath the head. But unlike other teleosts, these are used for walking. And this is also something that Haley is really interested in in the frogfish, are the use of these pelvic fins for walking along the bottom. So these guys will actually do this sort of, when you look at that, when you see them, you sort of see like, but um, but um, but um. So they'll kind of walk along like that. And what they're doing is they're moving these pelvic fins against the ground. So they do little walking, their little pelvic fins. So we've got, we've seen pelvic fins, pectoral fins, we've seen the dorsal fin, and they also have a caudal fin, so very much like a regular fish, they've got a nice tail. And they also have an anal fin, which is also pretty typical in fish. There's always a, or often a fin right, um, right posterior to the anus. So those are all the fins. A um, couple more things externally. Let me see if we can see this. So if I bring this really close. Oh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see. I'm, what I'm trying to point out, if you see right here, there's a line of little dots. And that line of little dots is an extrasensory system that most fish have called the lateral line system. Yeah, those tiny, tiny little dots, they're really hard to see, but if you get the light just right, you can see them. Yeah, okay, that's good. And so, um, the goosefish has these lateral lines all over, not just its body, but its head. And what those are used for is they sense water movements. And so if there's a predator or prey that's approaching the goosefish, it can detect a disturbance in the water by using the lateral line. So they basically have an extra sensory system that you know we as mammals um, have absolutely no experience with. We can't detect uh, air vibrations except we have you know, we have hair that, that does a little bit of that for us, but fish um, can really sense water vibrations very, very well in their environment. Um, and I always wondered what it would be like to be able to have a lateral line system. Like, what is it like to perceive the vibrations around you? All right, so Haley's asked um, the question that uh, I always really like, uh, the, the, the thing that I always really like to talk about, which is about their, their breathing system. And so this is something, uh, that um, I studied as a PhD student. I studied how these guys breathe. And they do it in a really peculiar way. So like most fish, they take water in through the mouth, they pump it over the gills, and then they push the water out their gill openings. However, unlike most fish, their gill openings are in a really weird spot. That's the gill opening. And you'll notice that it's underneath the fin. And what that basically amounts to is the armpit. So if you look at this fish, you've got the mouth and then you've got the shoulder is right here. And this is basically sort of the axillary or the armpit region of the fish. And so that's what the gill opening looks like. 
That's very, very unusual for a fish. Normally, because they're they're opercular, whoop, got away from me. Their opercular bones are, and so opercular means like operculum, like if you watch your goldfish breathe, it's gonna have a flap that goes back and forth, and that's the operculum. And normally the gill opening is right behind the operculum. The opening is gonna be immediately after that operculum. But these guys, their operculum is way up here, and the opening is way back here. So the, the gill opening is no longer sort of right behind the operculum, and the reason why that is, is because they actually have an enormous gill chamber. And so by moving the opening further back along the head, they can make the gill chamber bigger by having more space for it. And what I mean by gill chamber is this whole thing right here. So I'm sticking my fingers into the gill chamber, so in the gill opening. And you can see these structures here. These are called branchiostical rays. And this is also something that I, I worked on a lot for my dissertation. These are my favorite structures in the whole world. Um, and they are called branchiosticles. And the reason why I love them so much is because I really love studying ventilation. I love studying how different fish breathe and how especially weird fish that have weird ventilatory systems um, manage to get the same job done, which is to pump water over the gills. And so these structures are really, really important in, in water pumping in fish. So you, you have the, the mouth can do some pumping, but also the gill chamber needs to do a lot of pumping. And what these guys do is they um, will, um, they want to be cryptic, right? So they want to hide. And so they will sit in the sand. And instead of, you know, if you watch a goosefish, it's going to, or uh, not a goosefish, a goldfish, it's going to be breathing, you know, once a second, you know, it'll take a breath, it'll take a breath, take a breath. But these guys, um, do something pretty different, which is, is that they breathe once every minute and sometimes much more than that. So, and it depends on their size. So a fish this size is probably gonna take about 90 seconds to go through a single breath. And the way that they accomplish that is by they just very, they sit there and very, very slowly expand these branchiostical rays. And so they have this huge gill chamber and they just fill it up with water very slowly over time and it gets really distended. So by the end of that minute, this chamber is just full of water and it can get quite a bit bigger. It's even hard to tell sort of how big this chamber can get. And they've got one on each side, so they've got a left and a right. And so basically um, they sit there and very, very slowly inhale. So they're, and while they're inhaling, they're drawing water over the gills the whole time. So they're getting plenty of oxygen. Um, but they're just doing it very, very slowly. They're slowly expanding those branchiostical rays um, and to fill up the gill chamber and to drive water across the gills. And then um, I have, this is something sort of hard to, hard to really grasp from, from looking at a dead one, but I've got some great videos of the exhale. And so they exhale, you know, once a minute, and it's a very quick exhale because they want to get back to being hidden. But basically when they exhale, the water comes out and the opening sort of forms this siphon. It's really hard to get a sense of the siphon in real life, but you can imagine sort of the this sort of a siphon with a lip, and it basically just opens up, they get rid of the water, and then it closes back up, and they go back to inhaling. Yeah, and in general, I'm really interested in fish that hold their breath. We just, um, and actually, goosefish technically don't hold their breath. We never actually observe them in the lab. We observe them all summer in the lab. We have great videos but we never actually observe them holding their breath. They inhale very slowly over uh, a minute, but then as soon as they're done inhaling, they exhale. And, and it's like, uh, it, it takes a very long time. So it's, it's, it looks like they're just sitting there holding their breath, but they're actually moving the entire time, which is one of the main things that we pointed out in the paper is that even though it looks most of the time like they're not doing anything, if you speed up the video, normally you have to slow things down to see the cool details, but for goosefish, you have to speed everything up. If you speed up the video, you can actually see they're moving the entire ventilatory cycle. It's just extremely slow. However, we did find a, um, goose fi or a, a an angler fish that does hold its breath, and that's the deep sea coffin fish. So we just uh, had a paper out on the coffin fish, and we were actually able to see that they that they actually do hold their breath. And um, interesting about banjo catfishes. Someday I'm going to get them in the lab and and uh, see if that's what they do too. Um, they do lots of banjo catfish. 
do lots of weird things with their ventilatory system. So that's definitely something that I'm super interested in. Yeah, so it's the same thing with the condor, exactly. So if you ever want to watch a sea star uh, do anything interesting, you have to speed up the video. You have to kind of do a time lapse um, in order to see them actually uh, doing what they do. But they do move. They, you know, they do get around. It's just almost imperceptibly slow. So very, very similar to what the goosefish is doing. So that's the breathing. I do love, uh, you know, to watch them breathe. I do love their ventilatory anatomy. We describe some of the muscles that they use to make that really slow breathing happen. You might be able to see the gills if I open this up. Yeah, so you can see the gills in there. And the gills are pretty far forward. Like the gills are like right here and the gill opening is way back here. So the gill chamber is behind the gills and it just very slowly expands drawing water over the gills. And are they able to breathe faster? I mean, I think like the muscle physiology of the slow breathing is something that um, I'm not a muscle physiologist, but I've been fascinated with and would love to collaborate with a muscle physiologist on it someday because, and also like a neurobiologist, because I think there's some fascinating, um, you know, questions about how do they control that slow breathing? Um, uh, how do they modify their central pattern generator to do that? Um, how do they, how do they move their muscles so slowly? Um, so a lot of people are interested in how muscles move quickly, but there's also really interesting questions about how muscles might move slowly. So um, I haven't done any, any uh, muscle physiology on these guys, because um, that's not really work that I do, but I think there's lots of really interesting questions. Um, and, oh, are they able to breathe faster? So um, the fastest way, and like I said, the, they breathe a little bit faster when they're small. So the smaller the fish, the faster the breathing. Um, but we found that even the tiniest ones tend to breathe once every, every you know, 10, 15, um, maybe, um, you know, maybe, a, uh, um, you know, around 10 or 15 seconds. Even the, you know, we found, we've had like little tiny ones, like the one that John CT scanned. We've had them in the lab and they breathe like every 30 seconds and they're totally fine like that. Um, but I've seen small ones get up to like eight seconds and then die shortly thereafter. Um, it was in some kind of distress. And the only way that I knew that was because, you know, I was looking at the fish and I was like, wow, it's breathing so quickly. And everybody looked at me like I was crazy because it was breathing, you know, once every eight seconds, which is, you know, enormously slow, you know, try to sit and do nothing for eight seconds and you'll realize pretty quickly how slow that is. Um, but, you know, I was like, I've never seen a goosefish breathe this fast. There's something wrong with the fish and there definitely was something wrong with it. Um, so. So they can breathe faster if they are really in a um, stressful situation and it's usually not a good situation. Um, and they're sort of, I sort of consider them to be sort of on this weird metabolic edge where like you look at them the wrong way and, and they sort of tip the scales and, and they die. So if, if they get stressed out, uh, they really have a small margin of error in terms of their metabolism. I think partially because of this really efficient breathing system that they have, but also if, if, if they're not able to sit there and breathe slowly, they're really, really in trouble in terms of getting enough oxygen. And one of the reasons is because like, so breathing in fish is very energetically expensive. Breathing in humans, not very energetically expensive. We don't even really notice um, our, our breathing in terms of um, uh, you know, um, how much energy it takes us. Um, it's really easy to move air. So air is not very viscous. It's, it's pretty trivial to move a volume of air. Um, and also air is very oxygen rich. And so we don't actually have to do a lot of work to get the amount of oxygen that we need from the air. We just pull it right out of the air. Uh, we don't have to worry about, you know, moving it in one direction. We, we just have to just get it into our lungs, get it back out, get another one. We're good. Fish, um, it's, it can be, um, there have been estimates up to 15% of the total energy budget of a fish uh, is ventilation. I think the, the average number is probably uh, much lower than that, probably somewhere around 5 or 10%, but it's still like a significant portion of an energy budget for a fish is breathing because they have to pump water and water is very viscous. It's not very oxygen rich. And so they have to move a lot of it in order to get the amount of oxygen that they need. So um, that's one of the main reasons I'm really interested in breathing from a biomechanics perspective is because, um, you know, they're really under a lot of selective pressure for the system to be as, as you know, uh, efficient as possible. And so from an evolutionary and biomechanical perspective, there's lots of really cool variation, lots of different ways that different fish have solved that problem. All right, do we want to cut her open?
I did promise a dissection, and I haven't cut anything yet, but that's because most of the interesting stuff about a goosefish is, um, I don't know if it's a her, and I don't actually know if I'm going to be able to tell when we get in there, um, but um, uh, most of the interesting anatomy, I think, is on the outside, but there is some cool stuff to point out on the inside. Um, I don't know if there's a good way for me to show you guys what I'm doing. It's not bad. There's a bucket of dead rats behind me. That's for my comparative anatomy. Get that out of the way there. All right, let me see if I can sit down. With this little easier. Okay, how's that? All right, so now I'm going to, I'm basically gonna start at the anus or the, it's, um, it's also a cloaca in the sense that it's the combined exit for the reproductive system and the digestive system. And so I'm just gonna start there and cut forward. It's very easy to cut, they don't have scales cutting through the abdominal muscle. And Haley, you asked about the, the difference between the skin and the muscle, um, and if there's jelly. Um, I don't really see anything. This is uh, uh, this is skin here and abdominal muscle here. I'm sort of poking around. I don't really see anything jelly-like, but certainly um, some histology would, would help answer that question if that's something that you're interested in doing. You can get fresh tissue really easily. All right. Yeah, and uh, Emily asked about um, uh, determining the sex, and it's really hard to determine the, the, the sex. Most of the time it's impossible to determine the sex of a fish from the outside. Uh, you can usually tell from the gonads, um, and so hopefully we'll get to see those. And the anatomy is pretty standard for a goosefish. Um, except the main thing, the, their main sort of difference is that they're, they're very much meat eaters. So they're, are, are fish eaters. So they are, um, piscivorous. They are primarily interested in eating fish and therefore their digestive tract, much like other fish eating fish is very sort of set up for digesting meat. So it's a very short gut. So there's not a lot of intestine here. This is the intestine. Let me make sure I'm right about that. Start poking around here. Okay, this is, sorry, this this is the intestine here. So it's very short. So what's this? This is a gonad. Yes, this is a gonad. All right. So we've got gonads. If anyone in the audience knows fish gonads, <laughs> feel free to um, uh, um, jump in. I don't think that there is a way to externally di uh, diagnose the sex of a monkfish. There are some fish that have sexual dimorphism like that. Um, but I don't think these fish do. But you can see, um, I don't see anything that looks like little eggs. I'm fairly certain that these are testes. Yeah, so Catherine says it looks, looks like a male. Sharp edge in terms of like the point here or? Uh, the other thing we can do is we can look up a little bit further and see if there's anything else. Like if there were ovaries, you'd see um, some ovaries, some ovary tissue sort of up underneath. It's still a little frozen, which is how I like to do it because it's not quite smelly yet. Yeah, so there's nothing else up here. So I'm pretty sure that these are testes here. Oh, okay, sharp edge along the outer edge. I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of fish go dance up close and personal, so it's hard for me to tell whether or not this is soft or hard. Sh or sharper or soft compared to other fish, but it's definitely, I, I definitely don't see anything that looks like eggs. Yeah, fairly certain that this is a boy, all right, or uh, a male fish. Let's not uh, make any assumptions. All right, so we've got testes, sweet. So you can see they've got a lot of vasculature, they're very, got lots of blood vessels, and then you can see that they, Here's the reproductive duct that is going to bring the sperm out the that shared opening of um, the digestive and respiratory tract. So this is the out, outflow for um, the, the gonads, in this case, the sperm, for, for the test, uh, testes producing sperm. So very nice. Okay, so what else do we have in here? So 
Has anybody ever had monkfish pate? Or actually, wait, we have some more questions about the gonads. Let's, let's stick with that for one more second. But yeah, if you've had goosefish pate, let me know. Um, yeah, so I, I am fairly certain that this is mature. Um, uh, an immature, um, immature testes are really, really small and really poorly defined. This looks like a mature male. And just based on the size, I was pretty certain that it was guaranteed to be mature. Yeah, so Catherine says mature testes. Um, and so, yeah, so this is definitely a, an adult that's probably spawned at least once. Uh, goosefish spawn yearly. I'm not sure how much we know about the timing, but the females is really interesting. Um, so John mentions uh, goosefish eggs. And the goosefish eggs are, um, uh, they are arranged into a veil. So most of the time, fish eggs, you know, maybe they're loosely bound together with some tissue. But for the most part, fish eggs are sort of, you know, just little eggs that are free. Um, but goosefish produce an egg veil, which is a whole basically veil of millions and millions of eggs. And, um, and they just release that once a year. And, um, and then they get fertilized, the, uh, gets fertilized by the male. And I'm not sure we know too much about like the spawning process in goosefish. Um, but, um, but then basically the egg mass with the fertilized eggs just sort of floats around in the ocean until they hatch. Um, and so, um, so it's a really, um, a really cool, uh, um, reproductive system that I don't know too much about other than the egg veil. Um, but, um, it's a really unique, uh, way of, um, of getting your larvae up in the water column and floating around where, um, the, um, where all the nutrients are going to be, where all the food is going to be for those critical first few days and months of life. Um, the, the larvae of these guys are pelagic. They swim around up in the water column, and then eventually they become benthic, like the adults, where they um, pretty quickly settle onto the bottom, and then they, um, they uh, lose a lot of their pelvic fins and they gain a lot of impactoral fin. So they go through a pretty big transition in those early stages of their life. Any other reproduction questions? I'm not a reproductive the expert, but uh, they are, they, they are really, they do have some really cool stuff. All right. So um, if you've ever had goosefish pate, if you've ever, or monkfish pate, if you've ever seen it on a menu, that is this right here, goosefish liver. I don't know. I'm sure there's a very good reason that everybody knows about why the liver is so orange. I don't know what, um, uh, what sort of substance is making it so orange, but this is fairly typical. It's bright orange liver. It's a, um, I actually have had um, monkfish pate. Uh, my students sort of, uh, you know, under false pretenses, invited me out to um, a restaurant, and I was really excited. I was like, wow, this is so nice of them. They're so great. And it was because they had seen that there was monkfish pate on the menu, and they wanted me to eat it. And I'm a vegetarian. But I do have one rule, which is that I will try anything once. And so I tried the, the pate and it was, it was, I've never had regular pate, so I don't actually have anything to compare it to, but it was, you know, I can see why people would find it tasty. It wasn't bad. So that's the liver and they've got multiple lobes of the liver. So usually the left and the right. Yeah, I don't, I don't see the other lobe, but there's a lot of variation. All right, so then this part here, between the lobes of the liver, this is the stomach. And there is definitely something in the stomach. So should we open it up and see? I hope it's not just ice, now that I've promised this. But So Jonathan the other day found, um, or not the other day, um, uh, earlier, um, earlier this year, uh, did a CT scan, a really beautiful CT scan. That's the one we were talking about today on Twitter. And he found an eel in the stomach. Um, so, you know, because these are piscivorous, they, they eat fish whole. And so when you dissect them or when you look at them in CT, you often will find a two-for-one special. You'll often find a fish in the stomach. So we've got one here for sure. So I just cut the stomach open. Something in there for sure. It's definitely a fish. Oh, yeah, it's got a nice tail. Oh my goodness. Oh 
a while. Still a little frozen. There might even be enough here. Often there's not enough to really identify anything, but we may actually know. Sort of falling apart. Oh my goodness. Oh, I got excited. I thought it was something. Let's see. I thought it was something that was going to have like armored scales or something we we're going to be able to identify, but um, it doesn't look like it. But I'll show you. We've got some vertebrae. This is definitely part of the tail. We've got some really nice uh, neural spines coming off the top of the vertebrae. So we've got a pretty well digested fish here. We're not going to be able to figure out what this is. I don't even see that. Like, this is bizarre. I don't know if any fish people can really see here, but like there are vertebrae, but then there are these little things sticking up, and I don't know if this is just like if these are neural processes. No, they're not. They like bend over. Like they're little. Do many have any? I mean, I know this is really, really super digested, but like this is the vertebral column, and I have no idea what those little spiky things are. There's a lot of pigment, so there's still some skin. Wait a minute, this isn't a, no. Like, this isn't a jaw, those aren't teeth right now. It's definitely ver vertebrae. Huh. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna, ever, ever gonna be able to answer the question, but it's definitely a, definitely a fish. Oh, I've got part of the skull. There's the skull, at least part of it. It's a little eye socket. This is at the end of the vertebral column here. Wait, can I do that? <laughs> oh, we could probably sequence it. It's probably pretty contaminated. Yeah, who knows? All right, well, we had we found another fish, so we got a two-for-one deal like we usually do with the goose fish. Anything else? Let's see if we can find the gallbladder. Sometimes it doesn't use I don't see the gallbladder. Yeah, so what's the orange crate? So that is uh, liver. Yep. No, yeah, so, so John mentioned he was hoping it was a bird. Goose fish do eat birds, and I think that the idea is that that's where they got their name from. I don't know if they actually found a goose in their stomach, but these guys do um, regularly find things like puffins in their stomach. Anything that sits on the surface of the water, beware. Yeah, so that's the liver. You can see it up close. Oh, 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 gallbladder. All right. It's really small. Sometimes, like this is just individual variation. Sometimes fish will have a big gallbladder. Sometimes goose fish have a huge one. Sometimes they've got a little little one. Let me just without puncturing it. Anyway, that's you can see it there. The, that green, that's the bile. That's the gallbladder in there. Uh, we can see the heart. I'm not sure if 
Kyra, Kyra, are you there? Kyra said she might tune in. If she didn't, she's going to be sorry now. Get a quick look at the heart. Kyra is my um, PhD student. She is a heart, a fish heart enthusiast, just generally a heart enthusiast. So there's the heart. The, uh, believe, so fish only have one atrium and one ventricle. I believe that this is the atrium. This is the ventricle. Pretty big heart. Got a lot of love to give. Um, I think the uh, liver is just some sort of. I don't. I don't think it's decay. I see that in really fresh dissections. Um, it, and it's just like individual variation. Sometimes it looks very just cream colored. Sometimes it does look really mottled. Sometimes it's completely orange. I'm not sure exactly um, what causes that variation. Yep. Big old heart in there. All right. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, I was shooting for about an hour. I think we got there. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, dissected dogfish in high school. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's only, and that's a, a feature of all fish. Um, their circulatory system, it goes uh, atrium, ventricle, gills, body, atrium, ventricle, gills, body. So it's just one, uh, one circuit. Instead of us, we've got um, atrium, ventricle, lungs, atrium, ventricle, body. So we have to have two atrium and two ventricles. Yeah, and we, we did talk about this very briefly earlier, uh, these little pelvic fins here. You do see them, the fish walking. So that's what these are used for. And you can see them kind of lumbering along on their little pelvic fins. If we've got some people who are interested in the pharyngeal jaws, can't actually see the pharyngeal jaw muscles from this angle. So they're like right between the pelvic fins. Oh, I don't know if it's going to be very good. So um, in between the pelvic fin muscles, you do tend to see the pharyngeal jaw muscles. Oh, did I? No. Hmm. Some reason I can't find them. But the fringe of jaws are like right on top of the pelvic fin, so like basically like they're they're right underneath my where my fingers are. Right now. Um, I think they just use their fringe of jaws for uh, swallowing. Um, oh yeah, you want to check inside the gills? It's hard to get in there. They're really deep in there. But let me see. So I'm cutting open. So I've cut open the gill chamber here. So that big hole that we put in the fish before, um, I sort of completely demolished that hole. Um, and so the gills are up. Oh, actually, did I demolish? No, I didn't actually. Okay, cool, good. All right, so now I'm gonna cut through the gill opening. So it's a completely different chamber. So we're in the abdominal cavity right now, but the gill chamber is untouched. So let's cut through the gill chamber, see what we can see. Cutting through the beautiful brachiostomal small. You can see them really nicely. Right. So there are the gills right there. Nice and red, got a lot of blood vessels. Got four gill arches. And so the heart is just on the other side here. So there's the heart. Saw that before. There's the gills. They're very, very close to each other anatomically. So gills, heart right on the other side of the wall. So the ventral aorta just takes the blood right from the heart into the gills. And then pumps it, the dorsal aorta pumps through the rest of the body.
Oh, uh, one other thing that I noticed earlier, I'm not sure, oh, I might have lost them. There are a bunch of uh, uh, parasites. It's pretty typical for a goosefish, pretty typical for, for fish in general. Uh, let's see. They're usually on the stomach. I can't see. I don't see any really good ones to show you, but they're they're trematodes. So they like they're they're these little tiny worms that are sort of coiled up, and they just live there, and the fish don't seem to really have a huge problem with it. Well, coil of worms there. Oh, what do their gill rakers look like? I think they have, they have none. So they don't have any gill rakers. Um, so, okay. Smooth, no rakers. No filtration in this guy. Just swallow and be done with it. All right, I should probably get myself cleaned up here. But thank you all so much for joining me today. This was really fun. I really needed this. I should feel like a scientist again. And for me, being a scientist means ending my day with my hands full of guts. So thank you guys uh, for joining me. This was really fun. <laughs>